was a plane declared dead before it even flew, not by critics but by its rival's own strategy. Airbus built the A380 to solve the problem of crowded megahubs. It was a giant meant to rule a congested world, but Boeing was already building a different future with smaller, more efficient jets designed to bypass those hubs entirely. This is the story of the A380's $25 billion gamble and how it was grounded in America, not by technical failure, but by a future that arrived faster than anyone at Airbus imagined. In the late 1990s, Airbus faced an impossible challenge, how to break a 30-year monopoly held by its arch-rival Boeing. For decades, if an airline wanted a giant jet to cross an ocean, there was only one choice, the iconic 747. Airbus decided it wouldn't just compete, it would build something bigger, better, and more audacious than anything the world had ever seen. The result of that ambition was the A380, a commercial airliner with two full decks, four massive engines and the internal volume of a small cruise ship. It was a $25 billion bet that this was the undisputed future of long-haul travel. The grand vision was seductive. Airbus predicted that global air travel would grow so relentlessly that the world's major airports, places like London Heathrow and New York's JFK, would become hopelessly congested. Landing slots would be priceless. The only logical solution, they argued, was not more flights, but bigger flights. The A380 was engineered to be the ultimate congestion buster, a single aircraft capable of carrying over 500 passengers, effectively doing the job of two smaller jets. For airlines, this promised incredible efficiency. For passengers, it promised a new golden age of travel. The sheer scale of the aircraft was a marvel of engineering. With 50% more floor space than a 747, the A380 was marketed as a flying canvas for luxury. Airbus and its launch customers tantalized the public with visions of onboard bars, lounges, duty-free shops, and even private suites with full-sized beds. Emirates, its biggest customer, would famously make a first-class shower spa and a fully stocked cocktail bar the cornerstones of its brand identity. It wasn't just a plane, it was a destination in itself. But what many overlooked was the immense complexity simmering beneath the surface. The thing is, this level of customization created a manufacturing nightmare. Each airline wanted a different interior, which meant the 330 miles of wiring in each plane had to be unique. A failure to sync design software between the French and German factories sparked a crisis that led to years of costly delays, a first sign that the grand dream was on shaky ground. But the A380's biggest flaw wasn't in its wiring, it was in its core philosophy. The entire $25 billion program was staked on the unwavering belief that the hub-and-spoke model of air travel would dominate the 21st century. This was the system that built modern aviation. Passengers from smaller cities fly into a massive central hub, then connect to a giant plane that flies to another massive hub. Airbus was designing the perfect solution for this world. They were perfecting the past, but while Airbus was building a bigger, better version of the past, its rival was quietly building the future. And that future would make this giant obsolete before it ever truly took off. The complete and total failure of the A380 in the United States wasn't an accident. It was the inevitable result of a fundamental strategic collision. The aircraft was designed to solve a problem that America's biggest airlines simply did not have. While airlines like British Airways in London or Lufthansa in Frankfurt operate around a single, dominant mega hub, the US market is a completely different beast. The three American legacy carriers, American, Delta and United, built their empires on a network of multiple, geographically dispersed hubs. A passenger might connect through Dallas on American, Atlanta on Delta, or Chicago on United. This multi-hub system was designed to serve a vast continent, not to funnel all international traffic through one single choke point. This structural difference created a clash of priorities. For US airlines, the name of the game has always been frequency and flexibility, not sheer size. American travelers, particularly high-value business customers demand choices. They want a morning flight, an afternoon flight, and an evening flight. From an airline's perspective, operating two or three daily flights 
on a smaller, efficient twin jet like a Boeing 777 or a 787 is a far better strategy than a single massive A380 flight. It offers the scheduling flexibility customers want, it creates more connection opportunities across their network, and most importantly, it spreads the financial risk. This brings us to the brutal economics that grounded the A380 in America. The plane was sold on the promise of a very low cost per seat. When it was completely full, it was indeed incredibly efficient. But the thing nobody tells you is about its astronomical trip cost. The total price of flying the plane from point A to point B, regardless of how many people were on board, was massive. Its four engines guzzled fuel and its sheer weight meant higher landing and navigation fees. A full A380 could be a gold mine, but a half-empty A380 was a financial black hole capable of generating devastating losses on a single trip. This high-risk profile was a deal-breaker. Vasu Raja, a top planning executive at American Airlines, put it bluntly, stating that with nine different hubs, there was no single route where they could guarantee the 500-plus passengers needed every single day to make the plane work. Former United CEO Jeff Smisek was even more dismissive, calling the A380 a product for state-subsidized airlines that could afford such a risky gamble. U.S. carriers were in the business of mitigating risk, not concentrating it into a single 400-ton basket. They needed planes that could make money even on a slow Tuesday in February, not just during the peak holiday rush. The A380 was a plane built for perfect conditions, and the real world of aviation is rarely perfect. The A380's problems weren't just strategic, they were physical. The plane was so big it literally didn't fit in America's world. The A380's immense size was both its main selling point and a hidden curse. With a wingspan stretching 262 feet, it was classified as a Code F aircraft, the highest category. This meant it was too big to operate from standard airport gates. Any airport that wanted to handle the Super Jumbo for regular service had to undertake a series of incredibly expensive upgrades. Runways and taxiways had to be widened, bridges had to be reinforced to handle its 1.2 million pound weight, and airport gates had to be completely rebuilt with specialized multi-level jet bridges to load and unload both decks at once. This created a massive financial barrier. New York's JFK Airport, for example, spent a staggering $175 million just on airfield improvements to get ready for the plane. This sparked a classic chicken and egg problem. Airports were unwilling to spend millions on speculative upgrades without a firm commitment from airlines to fly the plane there. And airlines were unwilling to buy a plane that could only fly to a handful of specially modified airports. This severely limited the A380's network potential from day one, effectively tethering it to a small club of major international hubs. It was the opposite of flexible. Then there was the issue of its four engines. In the 1990s, when the plane was conceived, four engines were a symbol of safety and power for long-haul flights over water. But by the time the A380 actually entered service, a revolution had already happened. Advances in engine reliability led to the rise of ETOPS, or Extended Range Twin Engine Operations. Regulators certified that modern twin jets like the Boeing 777 and the Airbus A330 were so reliable, they could safely fly for hours from the nearest emergency airport. This completely erased the primary advantage of having four engines. Suddenly, four engines didn't mean safer. They just meant twice the fuel burn and twice the maintenance cost. What many overlook is the simple, devastating brilliance of its main competitor, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner. Boeing bet its future not on size, but on efficiency. The Dreamliner was designed to fly point-to-point, -point, connecting smaller secondary cities directly and bypassing the mega-hubs altogether. It was made of lightweight composite materials and powered by a new generation of hyper-efficient twin engines. Boeing was selling not just a plane, but a new, more profitable business model, one that perfectly matched the desires of both passengers and airlines for more direct, non-stop flights. The A380 was a superior solution to an old problem. The Dreamliner was the solution to the next problem. The irony is that Boeing would later face the same too-big problem with its new 777X, which has a wingspan similar to the A380s. But Boeing learned from Airbus's mistake. They designed the 777X with a simple yet revolutionary feature. 
Folding Wingtips On the ground, the tips fold up, allowing the massive plane to fit into a standard airport gate. It was an elegant, practical solution that gave the plane the flexibility the A380 so desperately lacked. So if the plane was a strategic, economic and logistical failure in the US, how did one airline, Emirates, build its entire global empire around it? To understand why the A380 failed in America, you have to understand why it succeeded in one very specific place, Dubai. The Emirates airline model was the perfect and perhaps only ecosystem where the super jumbo could thrive. Unlike US carriers with their spread out domestic networks, Emirates operates a pure global hub and spoke model. Its entire strategy is built around its single, geographically perfect mega-hub in Dubai, which sits at the crossroads of massive passenger flows between Europe, Asia and Africa. Emirates' business is to collect millions of international transit passengers, funnel them through Dubai and redistribute them onto other long-haul flights. This model is precisely what the A380 was designed for, creating the kind of dense, high-volume routes that made the plane profitable. Emirates didn't just buy a few A380s, it bought nearly half of all of them ever made. By operating a massive fleet of over 100 super jumbos, it achieved incredible economies of scale in maintenance and crew training that no other airline could match. This turned a potential liability into a powerful competitive advantage. They leaned into the plane's size, making its onboard bar and showers the centerpiece of their marketing, turning the aircraft itself into a reason to fly with them. But here is where a wilder theory emerges. Some insiders whisper that the very luxury that made the A380 an icon for Emirates made it toxic for American carriers. US airlines built their empires on ruthless efficiency, not champagne and showers. Adopting the A380 would have meant creating a new class of service so far above their standard offerings, it would have made the rest of their fleet look mediocre, a standard they couldn't afford to maintain. But was it just about business models, or was something more protectionist at play? The thing nobody tells you is about the unwritten rules of industrial warfare. For a major US airline to choose a European superjumbo as its flagship over an American-made Boeing would have been seen as an act of betrayal. Some analysts believe there was a quiet, informal, gentleman's agreement in the boardrooms of American United and Delta. The A380 would never fly in their colors. It was a strategic move to protect Boeing, America's aerospace champion, from a European invasion on its home turf. The program's deep dependence on Emirates ultimately became its greatest weakness. For years, their steady stream of orders was the only thing keeping the production line alive. This made the entire $25 billion program incredibly fragile. The end came swiftly. In February 2019, Emirates cut its remaining order. With no other significant buyers on the horizon, Airbus had no choice. On the same day, they announced that production of the A380 would end. The program never made a profit. But what if the profit was never the point? This leads to the wildest theory of all, that the A380 was never meant to be a commercial success. What if it was the most brilliant, most expensive Trojan horse in industrial history? Consider this. Airbus knew it was years behind Boeing in composite technology. It needed a massive, ambitious project to force itself to catch up, a project so grand it would attract government support and a few key launch customers with deep pockets like Emirates. The A380 was that project. Airbus used the $25 billion program as a publicly funded R&D lab. The lessons learned and the technologies invented for the Super Jumbo, from its advanced glare fuselage to its modular avionics, were directly transferred to its next big project, the A350, a modern, hyper-efficient twin jet, a direct and hugely successful competitor to Boeing's Dreamliner. The gamble didn't fail. It may have succeeded in its secret mission. The A380 was the sacrificial queen that allowed Airbus to win the chess match. So here's the question. Was the A380 a colossal failure or was it the most expensive, most important lesson in aviation history? Let us know what you think in the comments.